Have you been researching a little while or a long while? And you have all kinds of notes and cards and, and files that just need to be sorted and go somewhere. <laughs> well, join me as I go through some old files and notes. Maybe the right way that I should have the first time. Hey, it's Mark Lowe with Kentucky Tennessee Research. And, you know, got all these notes and files. And I've been researching a long time. And I've used index cards virtually since I be began. In fact, you know, my story is I began as a seven year old. So I had large notes of paper that I wrote with that great big pencil the size of your thumb. Uh, the, you know, second grade, that, that great big one that smudged everywhere. I kept those notes for a long time. At some point, I decided to go through those. But, you know, as we research, we gain notes. Sometimes we take the time to organize those notes within our files. But occasionally, we just have a pile that we need to go into. And that's what we need to do with. I, I'm now going through lots of old files and notes. So I think it's a good time to, to look at that and figure out what we should do. Because I only want to handle these now, maybe one time, um, particularly if they have good information on them. Okay, So the point that we're going to do is we're going to review the old notes. We're going to recheck the info on those notes. We're going to cite the source if it's given, or we might look where this information probably came from. Either way, we'll begin to look at the data. Well, let's look at an example of one that I came through today. Okay, uh, In fact, it's an old index card. In fact, it's a yellow index card. You can't tell from there. It's kind of light. And I wrote some notes on there. Now, one of the failings that I, I did not put the date that I collected this information, but this is the information as I recorded it. PA Great House. Now, I can tell you that on the index, it was a death certificate index. I can tell based on the information that I wrote up underneath that. And I added Perry Andrew uh, when I got back and looked at some notes later. It does have a death certificate number, uh, has a volume number and a, a digital certificate number. And then the note at the bottom as to the relationship, I obviously wrote that later. It was not on the index, and I can kind of tell that because of, of the writing. I know the pen looks very similar, but I've been doing research long enough to kind of recognize my writing that I wrote that later, okay? That he was the son of Sidney and Josephine Strange Greathouse. So often, we might make a note now and then add to it. But what happened is this note ended up just in a loose file, it was not placed in the appropriate place, um, you know, with my with with the Great House family, for example. Okay, now what do we need to do with that? And let's look in, again at that process. Anything that we have, number one, I need to confirm. And if I have a lot of this, and trust me, I have lots of papers around. I need to arrange that. So often, I could go through it just. Pick up a card, deal with it. And I, sometimes I do that, and that works. Uh, but I'm going to confirm the information that's on that card. If I actually look in my data file or on a family tree um, uh, in the database and realize I have all of this information, then I might just, if there's nothing new or nothing uh, that needs to be added, I could just throw that card or piece of paper away. Okay. For some folks, that's hard to do. I understand that. I grew up in the time when researchers were told to keep every little piece of paper. But that's not practical anymore. And at the point when you collect lots of little pieces of paper, then no longer is it practical to keep doing that. So I'm going to follow up with this piece of information. Okay, If that's the case, I should be able to verify that. Well, number one, Perry Greathouse. Uh, I know where he lived. He lived in Warren County, Kentucky. And so I, I could actually do a quick search, and I did. 
And come to find out, I had a newspaper clipping. Now, here is a, a brief uh, announcement of the funeral services for Perry Greathouse, uh, 67, who died Saturday. This pu was published in the Louisville Courier-Journal on the 4th of November in 1930. It was held at the residence in Smith's Grove, and that is a town in Warren County, Kentucky, where my family uh, is all grew up, and it's where we still have the family reunion today. Uh, it tells uh, a little bit about his surviving family, <coughs> excuse me, and where he lives, and this is more than was contained on that index reference, but it doesn't match because this is 1930. Hmm. The data that I had earlier said, I think 1942? So, need to look a little closer. So, as I go back and arrange the data, I actually looked up uh, death, Kentucky Death Index reference. Now, remember, there were times past when I collected data that wasn't as readily available as it is today. And often I made notes that when I got home that I thought I could compile. Obviously, from what I pulled this from, this is a copy. Uh, there's the card. On the right is the basic data from the death index. It's not Mr. Greathouse. It's actually his wife who died in 1942. He died in 1930, as we saw from the earlier record. So in reality... I'm beginning to think, why did I note this record? Was it Mrs.? But note, I noted that he was the son of Sidney and Josephine Strange Great House. Now, often when we collect data, we realize that, you know, what I've done is I've, I've gotten data in front of me, but it's not complete. And often that could have been recorded and I might have had a notation that he died in 1942. If I had actually copied that in the database, maybe I would have realized there was already an error if I had a previous record. Now this is how errors creep into our research and it's a good way to actually just stop and notice how we do this. You know, as we look at information, particularly if we're answering a question and then we take the answer of that question and put it directly with the source into our database or in our notes or in our files, our notebook, whatever we might do where we collect data, then we're less likely to uh, create as many errors as when we just collect data and then try to put it together. Now, we all tend to collect data at times, so it's, it's the process of thinking how we use it and making sure that we have a source for each piece of data and evidence that we're adding to our family history. It just helps it flow and, and, and confirm itself a little more better. So we want to confirm the data always, but it's always helpful if we arrange the data, uh, put it in order by date, put it in order by family, uh, arrange the notes by the date we collected them, which would be chronological. Um, whatever process we do, we want to be consistent, consistent in that aspect, okay? So with this data, uh, I'm going to go further with it before I add it to the information. And in fact, rather than use the death index, uh, I actually had pulled a copy of Mr. Greathouse's uh, death certificate. Now, I will tell you this. Once I'm running across this many years later, having done this, uh, I, I won't tell you how many years ago I probably pulled it originally, but at some point, it's always good to take the time and go back and just read it again, as though you hadn't seen it before. Looking at the information, I noted things that stand out to me, maybe that didn't stand out before. It could be the cause of death. could be the place of burial. It could be the relationships of folks there, notation of address, anything. So often when we go back and look at old notes, we see them with different eyes because we now have more information often about the individuals than we did in the past. So that's a good thing about looking at old notes. We might see things that we missed originally. You know, often we collect little pieces of information like this, a single document that tells part of a larger story. And that's exactly what we want to do as we focus on it. You know, over the years I've collected 
little clips of, of uh, newspaper clippings about families that I were, was researching. I, I might have collected even what we often used to call just little bits of gossips or notices from the paper. Uh, on this particular Truett family, I collected lots of little clippings of the family in California. Now, at the time, I don't think I thought about compiling them into a piece of information. And now I'm back to the point of saying, what do I do with that? Again, the thought of putting it in some order, confirming the information, and uh, digitizing it or making note of the information. For example, these are small pieces of paper. Um, how do I want to maintain those? In reality, the best way probably would be to photograph them, very much like I've done here, with a source citation perhaps, and then just digitize that or, or take that photocopy or that or photograph, add it to the file, and then make the notation. Or I could do transcriptions. Whatever works best for you, at some point, then I've included it within the information and I've in, arranged it, I've confirmed it, and I've made note of the information, okay, including the source. So I actually have it probably worked on a little better. Now, amongst my ugh, hundreds of notes, as I've met people over the years, perhaps at a reunion, perhaps at a genealogical conference, and we get to talking about family, and I pull an index card out of my pocket. On one side, I wrote the name of the person, his address, his phone number, and a few biographical details. But on the back, I wrote this basic information. His father was Henry Gunnels. His mother was Bessie Jane Lowe. She was the daughter of Pilch Lowe. Okay? And that information is exactly what I need to actually now put that piece of information within the concept of my family files. I'm glad I had it. I'm glad I kept it. But now to deal with it, what do I need to do? Okay, I'm going to review the old notes. I'm going to recheck the info and I'm going to cite the source the same way that we talked about earlier. So I'm going to arrange it. In this case, I'm going to actually look up the family and probably the close connection if I had not added the person on the other side, uh, the grandson of Pilchlow, then I would go to Pilchlow within my database. Okay, or within my files. And then I'm going to confirm that he had a daughter named Bessie Jane. And at that point, and I can make the notations that I have a note based on the date. And I actually know who I got this from because it's on the other side. I won't show you that name, but I actually have that cousin's name on the other side. So I can include that information. I'll be able to take this and actually put this note within my file and then eliminate this card. I do not have to keep this card any longer. Uh, I can, I can, but what's the point? I have the data. So as long as I do consistent, good, solid, reliable backups, and I do lots of backups, um, that's the next thing we'll probably should talk about some point is making sure your data survives in whatever format as it changes throughout the time period, okay? That's what's kind of important in the process, is making sure that we're consistent. So when we go through our old notes, and we definitely are going to have old notes and old files, and sometimes I'll go through them and, and it was bad information. I will may make the notation, I'll keep that information so that I don't follow that same pathway again. I'm going to always verify it. I'm going to cite the source or sources and make sure I include them in the process. Because genealogical research often is collected in small pieces of information. And that's why it's important for us to uh, collect, identify, arrange, and to make sure that we track that. You know, it's great to be able to have information today and put it in a digital format. But back in the day, as I met, as I was in an archives or I met someone and I collected pieces of paper. In fact, you know, back when I started, I would have to travel over an hour to look at a census record. And often I would write that census data, um, you know, in a format that I could read so that when I got home, then I could study that even more closely. Don't have to do that today, but I kept all these notes. And so today, for example, I've gone through this one page 
And again, I have verified the data. I've rechecked it. I've actually looked. This uh, all came from the 1920 U.S. Census in, in Kentucky. And so I went through and verified the information on each family. Any notations that I had, they came directly from the 1920 census. I made sure they were added, included in my database. And then I made notes as I read them about things that I saw. If I did not see that note included in my file, then I made that notation and added it with the full citation for each of the census pages that were included in this little extraction that I did some time ago. Well, research continues. You know, that's one of the great things about genealogical research is that we learn almost all the time. Sometimes we learn when we are going to answer a specific question, and sometimes we learn when we just mull and ponder. We just slow down and review the research that we've done before or the data that we've collected. Analysis comes by looking closer, by asking those questions again, and making sure that we got complete answers are at least answers that helped us move to the next question on our list. Research never ends. And by the way, it seems like it's time to go look up a new question. So join me on down the road. If you're enjoying the process, be sure to subscribe to the list and you'll be notified of everything we do. And thank you. And let me know if there are things that you would like me to look for that will help you further in your research. Have a great day. Thank you.